Welcome to Boardroom Broadcasts, speaking with listed companies from around the world. You can stay up to date with all our content by visiting www.boardroombroadcasts.com and clicking on subscribe. Paul Brennan was appointed the CEO of Polynovo in 2015. He has extensive knowledge, exposure, and understanding of the health system through his clinical background and commercial exposure with various multinational companies. He has coordinated the marketing, global strategy, development, new product development, and regulatory processes for the Asia-Pacific region for industry-leading organizations in relation to medical products and devices. His previous experience includes marketing director and sales director with Smith & Nephew Healthcare from 2008 to his commencement with Polynovo in 2015. Paul, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. So, firstly, can you explain to us what Polynovo does? Yeah, Polynovo makes um, a range of medical devices out of a unique polymer that's biodegradable and uh, very cell-friendly, um, meaning that it's non-toxic uh, to new cells. So we help reconstruct damaged tissue um, in a variety of fields uh, with a novel polymer uh, that you then uh, excrete through your urine or breathe off through your lungs. And we touched on it briefly in the, in the introduction, but before you came into Polynovo, do you want to expand on your corporate experience before joining the organization? Yeah, well, I suppose... My background, I've always had a curiosity in manufacturing and um, product development um, at uh, Convitec, Hansel and Smith & Nephew. So I've always been curious as to how each part of the business works and when the opportunity came uh, to apply for the CEO role here at Polynovo, I thought it was a very good um, synthesis of all the things that I've been doing in other areas, um, concentrated into one role. It's ever-changing, very dynamic. Uh, we're fast-growing. Uh, it's very challenging. Um, but a lot of those core strengths on marketing, um, corporate structures, quality management systems, uh, manufacturing, um, are things I've been able to draw on in this role. Okay. Now... Let's talk a little bit more about uh, the technology that, that Polynovo offers. For people that, that might not know much about it, can you take us through uh, you know, what it does in practice and its applications? Sure. Um, the first product that we've got to market is uh, Novazorb, a biodegradable temporizing matrix. That's a long name. We shorten it down to BTM. And basically, whenever you lose uh, the underlying structure of your skin, which is called the dermis. That's the layer of your skin that has all the blood vessels, fat, elastin, and, and cellular structures. Um, you may lose that through excision, such as a wide excision of a melanoma, road trauma, uh, burn, um, reconstructive surgery, um, infections, um, a wide variety of causes. Uh, we can actually regenerate that dermal layer um, by putting in our unique polymer and your cells of the dermis grow back into that layer and revascularize. It remains inside you for up to 12 months and it dissolves away over that period. And as I said before, you excrete it through your urine predominantly as lactic acid and you're left with a very supple and mobile skin as you would normally have and a very good cosmetic and functional outcome. So that product is now on sale in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and the United States um, with other markets coming on stream shortly such as Israel and Saudi Arabia. So that's the sort of first product to market and then we'll talk a little bit later but the next range of products will be our breast products and our hernia products. Okay and what uh, behind the scenes what's the process to take something like this to market? Can you take us through a little bit of the, the development of this through to you know commercialization? Sure well, the technology was invented by the CSIRO and 
uh, spun out into a uh, listed company uh, to fund its development pathway in 2004. It's had a bit of a tortuous path in various uh, corporate ownerships, but uh, we had a company restructure and a new board uh, come on board in 2014 and really put the investment behind uh, getting this product commercialised and developed. So since 2014, we've uh, built a clean room manufacturing facility, um, enhanced our quality management system, built our regulatory team, um, our R&D science team as well. And we've done all of the um, animal studies that were required and all the laboratory works. And now we've got a product that's fit for human use and has proved itself in human use to be exceptionally good. I, I might be overstating it because my enthusiasm, but it is a very good product um, which gives um, very good uh, both aesthetic and functional outcomes for patients who have been treated with it. What's unique about it is that in this space, um, the products that are used today are animal derived. Um, so they're biological products and so they've got foreign proteins in them. By having a purely synthetic product that is um, bioreabsorbed by your body and replaced with your own tissue, you have no foreign proteins um, or foreign body risk um, with this product compared to using a biological product. And so what does that mean for the organization in terms of, you know, its overall growth? You mentioned as a, as a polymer, uh, it can be made into you know, medical devices or, or almost anything. So, you know, where do you guys see the pathways to application for this? Um, the pathways are as broad as your imagination can take you in reality. Um, but the, the stark reality or the commercial reality is that you can only do so much at any one time. So for us at the moment, it's about um, the biodegrading temporizing matrix, BTM, having that established um, commercially within the market, bringing on our hernia range of products. So we'll make uh, products for hernia repairs that also uh, bioreabsorb and disappear. And a range of breast uh, products, a sling, a cover, and possibly a breast prosthesis, which we're partnering with another company, Establishment Labs, uh, to bring those products to market. Over and above that, there's a range of other things that are the sort of second tier of development, such as a drug eluting pellet. So imagine a polymer that has up to half its um, weight as a drug and as that polymer dissolves it releases a measured dose of a drug per day. Now when you have um, chronic diseases where you might have poor compliance by patients um, we may in the future be able to inject a, a bead under the skin and as that dissolves over a six month period deliver a measured dose of a drug to improve compliance. We are also growing um, with another company in Adelaide, beta cell technologies, islet cells, um, which are from the pancreas, that produce insulin and they can successfully be grown in pig studies within the BTM and produce insulin for type 1 diabetes management. That's still very experimental, but it shows good promise for the future. So there's some of the things that are on the near-term horizon, and there's many on the distant horizon that we could look at, um, but the here and now, what we're addressing, they would be the, the immediate two tiers of our focus. And how do you try to identify um, the overall market opportunity when it has so many different applications? It's Looking at where in the market there's a clinical need, um, you can make products that we would call a me too, um, but when you do that, you're not really innovating within the space and it's, it becomes a, a price game and it doesn't really change 
are the outcomes for patients. So what we're focused on is where are clinicians expressing pain points in our treatment modalities and how can our polymer be applied within that need uh, to address a clinical outcome. Okay. And uh, from the process of, of commercialization, for a lot of listeners, they, they would want to understand, you know, how this is going to make money and how it's going to grow. So we had, um, initially when we talked about it, you mentioned in Australia, uh, it's part of the uh, TGA and it has um, an exemption, which is how you're able to uh, get mass use out of it. Do you want to just explain that process of the regulatory environment, of how it works in Australia and also with your um, uh, you know, forward-looking FDA approval? Sure. Um, well, first of all, in the US, we already have FDA approval. Um, so we're registered and commercially on sale today in the US and the other markets that I, I spoke to. For Australia, uh, the current use is under what's called the TGA Prescribers Exemption Scheme and that's a pre-registration scheme. Um, so it allows individual surgeons to request the use of the product for an individual patient. It's not a, a blanket acceptance um, concurrent to that, uh, we filed our regulatory dossier with the TGA and we expect that um, in the second quarter of uh, 2018, a calendar year, to achieve a, an ARTG listing, which is the TGA regulatory approval. And that will allow um, any hospital and any surgeon to purchase the product uh, for its appropriate use. Uh, without having to go through an exemption application. And what does that mean uh, for, for the company and its growth uh, for, for listeners? Um, well, the US market will always be the largest market in the world and it's also the highest reimbursement or, or payment that um, we would achieve for the product. The Australian market um, by volume will be, in a global scale, a relatively small market. Um, but still a very important one for us as a home market and also one where we will make um, good margin um, and be profitable as a, a company. Um, so our commercial future looks very strong, um, but the main focus of uh, the commercial opportunity remains the US, followed by Europe, which will enter in end of 2018, start of 2019, and then the other countries around the world progressively after that is we can address the regulatory entry points uh, for each of those. And how, um, with with this growth into all these new markets, uh, how are you going to handle this? Uh, what's the, the strategy to, to sell into these countries? Yes, it's um, it's daunting at, at times, but... Um, the reality is the sale of uh, the product in the US should give us sufficient funds um, to launch our expansion into many of these markets, um, but we'll review those cash flows and points as we go along the journey. Um, for the strategy of entry, um, it's going to be country dependent on where these uh, particular products are used. Um, so for us in the American market uh, and the Australian market, it's uh, large surgical wounds are the area of most opportunity. So our focus there is to identify uh, plastic and general surgeons who have advanced skills within this space and target them um, for the entry into uh, that segment in the hospitals and then using them as key opinion leaders, um, bring on other surgeons in more general areas uh, in the use of the product as we go forward. And I assume your background through um, uh, your marketing work with uh, Smith & Nephew has given you sort of insights. As, uh, is, is there a particular way that, that you look to market this product to, um, uh, to healthcare professionals? Um, yes, well, as I said it predominantly a, a surgeon cell because it needs uh, the wound bed itself needs to be surgically debrided 
and then the product itself um, actually gets stapled in place into the wound. Um, so that's done under an anaesthetic. Um, so it's very much a surgeon focus um, for us as a, a product and how it's going to be used. When surgeons are, are looking for products, they're looking for several things. One is um, the efficacy of the product. Does it give a better outcome than what they can currently use? Second, what's the cost impact to the health system? Because they're increasingly under uh, budgetary pressures and accountabilities on the spend. And thirdly, what's the long-term outcome uh, for these patients when they use this product? So Professor John Greenwood recently published um, his long-term follow-up of the first five patients. And that was an outstanding publication, and that's published in the uh, Journal of Burns and gives a very good indication of the long-term um, reduced scarring rate and also the high elasticity of the skin. So uh, Professor Greenwood's done outstanding uh, clinical work in detailing every aspect of the development of this product and making sure that all of those patients have been followed up in the long term, along with his partner, Marcus Wagstaff, and the team at uh, Royal Adelaide Hospital. So we've got a very good um, clinical understanding of the application of the product and uh, the types of surgeons that would be adopting the use of this product in a hospital. Okay. And with all the growth that you're going through, is there is there a, a key driver? I mean, it sounds like uh, there, there's quite a big push. And uh, you know, when when we were speaking previously, you'd mentioned that uh, as an organization, your your staff numbers have grown quite incredibly. Uh, is there a one particular thing or a series of events that's that's led to this growth? Um, there's a multitude of factors in that, but predominantly, you know, a U.S. market entry is the key driver for the expansion of the staff. When we look at staff, um, we, people are a very positive resource for any company and the success of the company relies on the team and the staff um, and the output that they produce. So our staff are very um, focused on their particular areas, whether that's quality management systems, manufacturing, regulatory, marketing support, um, business development, um, et cetera, finance. Um, but in all of those, what is central is how does our product enter the market and improve the lives of a person who actually has a terrible need because of uh, their illness or condition uh, to be treated. So as we've expanded into markets, we've needed to service those customers and those needs and expectations and that's driving the increase in staff numbers. Along with that is our acceleration in um, research and development of the new product pipelines. So we've delivered the BTM to market and now we need to deliver to market both the press products and the new products and then after that those tier two development products. So that They've been the key driver. We've had a very supportive board. Um, our chairman is uh, very committed to um, investing in the company to make sure that it can succeed. Um, he famously uses many companies in Australia die of a thousand cuts, um, whereas uh, his approach in his business development has always been um, if it's a good technology, if there's a good applicable market, find the funds to invest behind it and put the right people in place so that it can be delivered and matured and achieved in the marketplace. So having a very active, engaged and supportive board um, is essential for our future growth and development and they've been very good. And for a company like Polynovo, when you talk about the investment in R&D, uh, would that typically go to continue to grow your product line or to uh, try to innovate and stay ahead of the curve on, on your existing products? Um, both. 
So um, definitely in innovating into the new product lines, um, as I've already outlined. But for example, in the BTM, the first product to market is what we'd call an unfenestrated version. So it, it didn't have little holes in the surface film to allow excess body fluids out um, rather than collecting as a fluid collection uh, within the product. So the R&D team have um, worked on a fenestrated version, which means putting little slits in the external film um, within the production process, which saves probably about 20 minutes in um, time in the operating theatre in preparation of the product. Now that frees up a nurse or a, a junior surgeon to do other more productive things than put holes in our film. So it's getting close to our customers looking at what's their experience, what's their need, and then incorporating those back into the design of an, a product improvement and then bringing that through the regulatory and quality processes so that we can market it. And we've achieved that with uh, the new fenestrated version and achieved a, a, a new 510K approval through the FDA in the US for that. Uh, Paul, uh, that's all the questions that I have from my end. Before we wrap up today, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, I think Polynova has got a very bright future. Um, often in Australia, there's the perception that um, Australia needs to, if we invent something, make it offshore. Um, we're very proud that we do make it here in uh, Port Melbourne. Uh, we are employing Australians and we are manufacturing and this is a unique market space in the world, uh, true innovation out of CSIRO and very proudly um, employing Australians and showing that we can as a country deliver innovative medical technologies to the world. So it's a very progressive and exciting phase that we're in. Paul, thanks for your time today. Pleasure. Thank you very much. This has been a production of BoardroomBroadcasts.com, a division of Romulus Rising Proprietary Limited, all rights reserved. You can stay up to date with all our content by visiting www.BoardroomBroadcasts.com and clicking on subscribe.